Vaccine storage, handling, and administration are critical components of a successful immunization program. To be as safe and effective as possible, vaccines must be stored and handled properly and administered correctly. These practices are essential to ensure the patients you vaccinate have the best protection possible from serious diseases such as influenza. In this video, Joellen Walicki, a nurse educator with CDC's Immunization Services Division, will answer frequently asked questions about proper storage, handling, and administration of influenza vaccines. Let's address some of the most frequently asked questions from healthcare personnel. What are CDC's recommendations for storing influenza vaccines? CDC recommends storing influenza vaccines in a purpose-built unit specifically designed for storage of biologics or, if necessary, a standalone household refrigerator. These units can vary in size from compact, under-the-counter styles to full-size units. If a household combination refrigerator freezer is used to store vaccines, CDC recommends using only the refrigerator compartment for vaccine storage. A dormitory or bar style refrigerator freezer unit should never be used to store any vaccine, including influenza vaccine. These units have been shown to pose a significant risk of freezing vaccines even when used for temporary storage. Using dormitory style units to store vaccines for the Vaccines for Children program or other vaccines purchased with public funds is prohibited. At what temperature should influenza vaccine be stored? All influenza vaccines should be stored in the refrigerator between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius or 36 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. What type of thermometers should be used for measuring temperatures in a vaccine storage unit? To ensure vaccines are within the appropriate temperature range, CDC recommends a continuous monitoring and recording digital data logger with a current and valid certificate of calibration testing, also known as a report of calibration. At a minimum, the device should record the temperature every 30 minutes. What are the vaccine storage recommendations when conducting off-site or satellite facility influenza vaccination clinics? Vaccines that will be used at an off-site or satellite facility should be delivered directly to that facility. If that is not possible, transport vaccines using a portable vaccine refrigerator with a temperature monitoring device placed with the vaccines. If this equipment is not available, containers and supplies specifically designed and tested for transporting vaccines can be used with a temperature monitoring device. If vaccines must be transported, transport only what is needed for the workday. The total time for the workday, including transport time, should be a maximum of eight hours. If you must transport vaccines in a non-commercial vehicle, use the passenger compartment, not the trunk. Immediately upon arrival at an off-site or satellite facility, vaccines should be stored in an appropriate storage unit with a temperature monitoring device, and the temperatures should be read and recorded a minimum of two times during the workday. If vaccines cannot be stored in an appropriate storage unit while at an off-site or satellite facility, they should be kept in the portable vaccine refrigerator that was used to transport them. While at an off-site or satellite facility, staff should place a temperature monitoring device, preferably with a probe in a thermal buffer, as close as possible to the vaccines. Read and record temperatures at least hourly. Keep the container closed as much as possible, and each staff member administering vaccines should remove only one multi-dose vial at a time for preparation and administration. A checklist to assist with planning off-site influenza clinics is available online. Additional information is available in CDC's Vaccine Storage and Handling Toolkit. 
How do you correctly interpret expiration dates on vaccines, including multi-dose vials? And do all flu vaccines expire at the end of flu season? No, all flu vaccines do not expire at the end of flu season. Although most influenza vaccines expire on June 30th, some expire during flu season. In addition, there can be confusion about expiration dates for multidose vials. Most influenza vaccines in multidose vials can be used through the expiration date printed on the label. As long as the vaccine is stored properly and not contaminated, or unless the manufacturer indicates otherwise. Sometimes the manufacturer specifies that once the multidose file has been entered, meaning the rubber stopper has been punctured, the vaccine must be used within a certain number of days. This is commonly referred to as the beyond use date or BUD. When using a multidose file of influenza vaccine for the first time, Check the package insert to determine if the vaccine has a BUD. If it does, calculate the beyond use date using the time interval found in the vaccine's package insert. Initial and label the vaccine vial with the BUD. Between uses, store multidose vials of influenza vaccine appropriately until the vial is empty or the beyond use date is reached. Any vaccine not used before the BUD should be discarded even if there is vaccine left in the vial. Is it okay for a large clinic that administers a lot of flu vaccine to draw up vaccines at the beginning of the clinic day? Vaccine manufacturers do not recommend that vaccines be pre-drawn in advance. This is because general use syringes are not approved for use as a storage system for drug products. Therefore, CDC recommends using manufacturer filled syringes for large immunization clinics. If vaccines must be pre-drawn, CDC recommends drawing up vaccine just before administration. Vaccines should not be pre-drawn before a clinic. Drawing up doses of vaccine days or hours before a clinic is not acceptable. At the clinic site, no more than one multi-dose vial should be drawn up at one time by each person administering vaccine. At the end of the workday, any remaining vaccine in the provider pre-drawn syringes should be discarded. Why does the flu zone package insert state that a maximum of 10 doses can be withdrawn from a multidose vial? Why has this been added? Because multidose vials typically contain a preservative to help prevent the growth of microorganisms, they can be entered or punctured more than once. The multidose vial of flu zone is licensed as a 10 dose vial for use in persons six months of age and older. Only the number of doses indicated in the manufacturer's package insert should be withdrawn from the vial. Children six months through 35 months of age receive a 0.25 ml dose. Persons 36 months of age and older receive a 0.5 ml dose. Whether the doses are 0.25 ml, 0.5 ml, or a combination of both, only 10 doses may be withdrawn from the multidose file. After the maximum number of doses has been withdrawn, the vial should be discarded, even if there is residual vaccine and the expiration date has not been reached. All stability data and studies were done with only 10 punctures to the stopper. Which influenza vaccine products can be administered to children 6 through 35 months of age? And what is the correct volume for each dose? There are two injectable inactivated influenza vaccines, Fluzone quadrivalent and Flulaval quadrivalent, that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in children six 
through 35 months of age. Both products are supplied in manufacturer-filled syringes and multi-dose vials. In November 2016, FDA licensed Flulaval for children 6 through 35 months of age. Both Fluzone and Flulaval are approved for this age group, but the dose is different for each product. The dose for Fluzone is 0.25 ml. The dose for Flulaval is 0.5 ml. Always administer the correct dose. For example, when administering flu vaccine to a previously unvaccinated infant that needs two doses, administer 0.25 ml of flu zone for each dose. If using flu laval, administer 0.5 ml for each dose. What are the routes of administration for inactivated influenza vaccines? Most inactivated influenza vaccine products are administered by intramuscular, abbreviated IM, injection. There are two ways to administer vaccine by intramuscular injection. In most cases, IM injections of influenza vaccine are administered using a needle and syringe. One brand of inactivated vaccine, Afluria, may be administered by jet injector, but only to persons 18 through 64 years of age. Healthcare personnel should be familiar with the anatomy of the area where the vaccine will be injected. When administering influenza vaccine, there are only two routinely recommended sites for an IM injection. These are the vastus lateralis muscle in the anterolateral thigh and the deltoid muscle in the upper arm. Injection at these sites reduces the chance of involving neural or vascular structures. Because there are no large blood vessels in the recommended sites, ACIP states that aspiration before injection of vaccines is not necessary. The needle should be long enough to reach the muscle mass and prevent vaccine from seeping into subcutaneous tissue, but not so long as to involve underlying nerves, blood vessels, or bone. Guidance on recommended injection sites and needle selection can be found in ACIP's General Best Practice Guidelines for Immunization and in the book Epidemiology and Prevention of Vaccine-Preventable Diseases, also known as the Pink Book. As of August 2014, the Pharmajet Stratus Needle-Free Injection System was approved by the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, for intramuscular injection. It may be used with one influenza vaccine product, a fluria, but only for persons 18 through 64 years of age. Additional information can be found on the Pharmajet Stratus website. The second route of injection is intradermal. Fluzone intradermal is administered by the intradermal or ID route. This formulation is not the same as intramuscular formulations of inactivated influenza vaccine. This is the only influenza vaccine that should be administered by this route. It should only be administered using the injection device packaged with the vaccine. What guidance is there for preventing injury if patients faint after vaccination? Since 2005, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, has received an increasing number of reports of syncope, or fainting, in adolescents and young adults after vaccination. Symptoms that precede fainting include weakness, dizziness, and pallor. Giving patients a beverage, snack, or some reassurance about the procedure has been shown to prevent some fainting. There are measures to reduce the risk of injury from syncope. Falls due to fainting can be prevented by having patients sit in a chair or lie down when they receive a vaccination. ACIP recommends providers strongly consider observing patients for 15 minutes after vaccination. 
Information on this topic is posted on CDC's Vaccine Safety webpage. Are there legal requirements for what must be shared with patients or documented in medical records? Yes, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act requires that a vaccine information statement, or VIS, be given to parents, legal representatives, or adult patients before administering any vaccine. Federal law requires certain information to be documented in the patient's paper or electronic medical record or on a permanent office log. This includes the vaccine manufacturer, the lot number of the vaccine, the date the vaccine is administered, the name and title of the person who administered the vaccine, and the address of the facility where the permanent record will be kept, the addition date of the VIS, which is located on the back of the VIS in the lower right corner. And finally, the date the VIS was given to the patient, parent, or guardian. Best practice guidelines also include documenting the vaccine type using the ACIP abbreviation, route, dosage or volume, and site of the vaccination. Healthcare personnel are also strongly encouraged to document the dose in their Immunization Information System, or IIS. Your facility may require other documentation. Follow your facility's policies and procedures for medical documentation. Our final question is, what are some common influenza vaccine administration errors and what strategies can be used to prevent them? A common error is inadvertent administration of expired vaccine. Always check the expiration date before preparing or administering vaccine. Expired vaccine should never be administered. Other administration errors we frequently hear about include wrong dosage or amount, influenza vaccine administered outside of the product's indications, and wrong route but there are effective strategies for preventing these types of administration errors. First, educate all staff administering vaccine about the influenza vaccine inventory. Always verify you have selected the correct vaccine to administer based on the product's indications. Store vaccines with similar packaging on different shelves of the refrigerator. Label the vaccine in the storage unit with the age or other unique indications. Check expiration dates on the vaccines on a regular basis. Remove any expired vaccines promptly from the storage unit. Only administer vaccines you have prepared. And finally, use standard ACIP abbreviations. A link to the standardized abbreviations list can be found on the ACIP webpage. Proper storage, handling, and administration of influenza vaccines are key to ensuring their safety and effectiveness. Exposing vaccines to temperatures outside the recommended ranges can reduce their potency, leaving patients who receive those vaccines without protection from influenza. To ensure your patients are most likely to be protected by the vaccines, make sure those vaccines are stored, handled, and administered as recommended. CDC staff members are available to answer your vaccine, storage, handling, and administration questions. Email us at nipinfo at cdc.gov. Thank you.